So this, the, the rough structure of this session is going to be uh, an introduction from Supriya uh, about her work. She's going to explore what cross-cultural actually means um, and how this applies in her work and the benefits and challenges she's found along the way. The second section is going to be um, how to get these projects off the ground, um, where to start, how to continue, how to get funding, um, and lastly, thirdly, um, the kind of future ideas of her projects, uh, any kind of vision she has, and um, the legacy of the previous projects. Um, and that's going to be a real chance for anyone to answer questions, uh, ask questions, I don't know, I keep saying answer, to ask questions um, and a kind of more of a discussion section at the end if anyone um, has any burning specific questions that Supriya can answer. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Supriya. Um, so she is, I'm sure some of you will know her already, um, she's a Carnatic vocalist um, who is the founder of the arts organisation uh, Manasa Mitra. So she's known for working in unusual and non-traditional performance spaces. Uh, she brings together a variety of different art forms like storytelling and dance and works with a huge variety of musicians and sound designers um, from such a massive range of genres and disciplines. Um, and she's had a super interesting career. Um, so she studied Carnatic vocal music from the age of five. Um, and for those of you that don't know, Carnatic music is the classical form of music from South India. So she studied that from the age of five. Um, but she initially had a career in the UK banking sector. Um, and then in 2005, she decided to follow her passion for bringing traditional and contemporary uh, Indian music and art to wider UK audiences. Um, so then she set up Manasa Mitra. Uh, which was initially, I believe, a very small organisation, volunteer-led. Um, oh, getting a nod from her, great. Um, and then it's, uh, it's now over 15 years um, developed to become quite a pioneering organisation, um, delivering challenging and thought-provoking programmes, um, lots of different collaborations and performances, which I'm hoping she's going to explain more about and tell us a lot about. Um, but I think the main aim of Madison Mitra is, is to bring the South Asian culture to a wider UK audiences and communities um, and to, yeah, I think kind of challenge audience perception a little bit as well. Um, and it's led to some really interesting performance locations, um, including, I was fascinated, Yorkshire Sculpture Park, York Minster, Huddersfield University, National Railway Museum, Kew Gardens, so really different varied spaces to bring this um, cultural work to. Um, and I'm sure, Supriya, you're going to be talking about some of your recent projects, um, but there was a few when I was, when I was having a look. The Sound of Tea, fascinating. So um, drawing on your experience of um, synesthesia, so experiencing lots of different um, uh, senses at one time. Um, and, and I really would love to hear more about that. Um, and so this is kind of your experience of um, the tea, traditional tea rituals um, from around the world. Um, and I, I was really interested to see that not only you had uh, musicians, electronics, cello, flutes, percussion, but you also had a tea expert as well. So can't wait to hear more about that. The amazing collaboration there. Um, and then also the lullaby uh, projects that you did um, bringing in uh, different musicians, but also um, working with different audiences wherever you were um, to talk about, create, collaborate um, on different lullabies. And I think that's going to bring a really interesting dynamic of uh, collaboration cross-cultural. Um, and then finally, um, well, not finally, because you've done a lot of different projects, but the one last one I wanted to mention was the Bollywood Jazz Project. Um, so that's, um, yeah. Bollywood music and jazz music and I wonder um, if you'll be talking a little bit about working with jazz musicians um, because they're two quite different um, groups of people I guess um, so yeah and, and of course so many other amazing projects in different communities you know um, theatre performances musical theatre pieces for children um, and other various uh, amazing performances that you've done um, around the world so um, it's great to have you here, Supriya, to talk um, uh, because you've had such a, a career change as well. So you really have the experience of starting something completely from scratch um, and building up a really strong network and creating such um, 
successful partnerships. So I'm going to hand over to you um, and to start us off for the first 20 minutes or so, um, and then we'll have time for some questions. Thank you very much, Jess. That was a very comprehensive introduction. I think you've said a little bit of what I was thinking I might have to say, so thank you for oh. that. <laughs> um, I, will, I will briefly go back right to the beginning, uh, which is my being uh, born in uh, Bombay in, um, and growing up in a very traditional middle-class uh, academic-minded uh, family. So that then resulted in the fact that uh, music was my passion. As you've, as you've said, I've learned music from the age of five, but music was never seen as a career by the rest of the family. They, they always encouraged me to think of a stable career, you know, something that would yield a regular income, keep me independent, that kind of thing. And um, the rest of the family were in accountancy. So guess what I did? I followed the footsteps and joined a bank. And at that time, it was considered to be a really prestigious job because Hong Kong Bank uh, was um, a very prosperous uh, foreign bank with, uh, with a few number of branches in India at the time. And uh, they were, you know, they, they had a reputation for being, um, uh, being uh, prestigious. So it was the ideal job to go into when I finished my degree in commerce and accountancy. And I was only 19 years old then. Uh, and so it was, it was considered, I was recruited from the campus. It was, all, it was all going as per my parents' expectations. They were really delighted. It was, it was perfect. And uh, truth be told, I, I enjoyed the years in the bank. I, I, must, I must say. And so I joined banking. I had... I do have a mathematical mind, which I think is in fact related to music as I've sort of discovered much, much later. But then I, I did have a uh, sort of uh, eye and a, a flair for numbers and things like that. So that naturally then uh, led me to the fact that banking wasn't too alien. And I also very much enjoyed meeting people. So it's people are my thing. I, I like meeting, talking to people networking so that really stood me in good stead in in my banking career and i did that for 20 years which uh, and spanning a few countries till i landed in the uk and joined hsbc and worked with them in a number of locations around the country uh, but the last one being in yorkshire and before yorkshire i worked in the channel islands briefly which was lovely but then i came into yorkshire joined the uh, joined the local chapter here and uh, at the time there was a sort of a you know a light bulb moment in my head where I couldn't see myself doing this for another 20 years till I retired from the bank it was it was almost as if uh, uh, you know as if something had uh, channeled a thought into my head and the minute the thought had actually um, formed I found that I couldn't continue with the bank anymore so up to that point I must say I was reasonably happy working with a the bank. There wasn't any problem. I was doing a great job. Everybody liked me. I liked everybody. Everything was great. But the minute the thought came into my head that this was not what I wanted to do, I couldn't do it anymore. So that then uh, had, that was a major career choice because uh, you're looking at a really good source of income and a prestigious job because I had risen in the ranks over the years. And then you think, do I give all that up? And I had a young family, children were growing up. And I was like, um, is this the right time to give up? But it was the right time to give up because if I hadn't done it, then I would never do it. So in hindsight, but at that time, that was my thought as well. I, I thought about was this the right time? And I decided it was because if I left it much longer, then I would um, sort of uh, be in a dead end job, which didn't please me. And I would be sort of stuck there for the wrong reasons. And then it would be too late for me to pursue the other reason, which was my passion. So in 2005, I uh, quit the bank and moved into the music sector. And the first thing that I did was do exactly what I would have done in the bank, um, which is I printed a lot of uh, leaflets. So I sat down one day, wrote a leaflet. I said, um, uh, I'm a performer. I can do a lot of work. I can perform. I can do this. I can do that. 
And um, I can also do school workshops. I can come in and teach culture, extra, extra, extra. So I posted these thousand leaflets. God knows what the postage was then. I don't even remember. So I posted all that out. And for the next possibly a month, I was waiting for the replies that, you know, I was expecting maybe 10 people will, or maybe, maybe 100 people will. I didn't get even one reply. And that was the most interesting thing for me. It was like, right. So obviously, printing leaflets and declaring my capacities is not the thing to do. So right back to the drawing board. And then I realized that I was in a brand new sector. I didn't know anything about the sector. I didn't know what the music industry in the UK was. I had a little bit of a knowledge of the Indian music industry. Obviously, I kept my contacts and everything else. But I had no knowledge what music in the UK meant and the creative sector as well. So who are the movers and shakers? Who makes the decision locally, nationally? What happens? Who, who, what do these people do? And then I found something very strange. And that was called funding. And I was like, really? People give money to me to realize my artistic vision that is a new one because in the bank everything was about money so you pay for something you get a service and it was it was uh, very it was it was a revelation for me that you know you had this whole industry which operated on a different basis to where i had come from and uh, so that started my journey so it was probably eight to nine months after I set up Manasamitra, because I did that straight away. I set up the company, gave a title, printed these leaflets, knew what I wanted to do, et cetera, et cetera, but got nowhere. And that was when I thought about it and I said, yes, I need to go back and do some research on what I really want to do and who's out there doing the same thing. So in, in 2000 and end of 2005, beginning 2006, I then decided to start from the beginning again, look at the people, who are the artists in the area, who are the musicians in the area, what do they do, uh, how do they survive, what, what is it that drives this uh, music economy in my local area, so that I can understand that first, and then move out wider. So I started networking, and I haven't stopped to date. I network, 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 network is my sort of almost mantra because the more people you know or the more people who know you personally, um, the better your chances are for your work to be out there. So uh, my mantra has been and always was, that was the first tool I discovered in my box, which was networking. And I was really good at it because the bank had trained me really well. So I could go out and make these cold calls and uh, speak to people that don't know me at all and tell them how good I am. And that took a certain amount of confidence, which I would not have had if the bank hadn't trained me for it. I was used to people saying no. And um, I, I'm still used to people saying no, but I never give up. If somebody says no, it doesn't mean no at all for me. So I, I, I just take the no at face value. It is just no at that point in time for whatever it is that I'm offering. It doesn't mean the no is a permanent no and the door has shut. And it was proven straight away. This theory of no not being no was proven straight away because the first venue that my uh, sites were set on was the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. Um, in 2006, it was a very beautiful space it still is, of course, a very beautiful space. Um, and going there often, watching the uh, you know, scenery and the atmosphere in the park, um, I, I had a question in my head, which was, why is it that the park is frequented by a certain demographic of people? Although the, in the surrounding areas to the park, there is a whole uh, multicultural society waiting to sort of explore the park. But then when you look at the park and who walks in the park and what happens, there was only a certain demographic of people in the park. And um, that sort of uh, was my first door. So I went knocking on the Yorkshire Sculpture Park door and I said, look, can we work together for me to create a cultural program that will bring in other parts of this local community into the spaces? And 
I knocked and knocked and knocked. I must have, I must have been there about uh, six or seven times, meeting after meeting after meeting, uh, trying to convince the uh, people that are in, you know, uh, who have the budget, so to speak. And uh, finally, in November 2006, that door opened and I was given a budget to program in the park in the in the auditorium, which is a tiny auditorium. It holds about 100, 120 people, but it was a start. And I used every influence I had with um, India and visiting musicians and people uh, and artists from other parts of Europe, everybody to bring them together to respond to the exhibitions in the park. So the whole idea was that, for example, a dance group from Sweden would respond to uh, Peter, Randall, uh, Peter Randall Page, or um, I would provide a musical accompany to Simon Armitage's poems. And we would create a confluence such that uh, anybody could come and watch the show, but then it would also bring a cross section of the population into the spaces who were not uh, used to being in the spaces and who would make the park a little bit more of a familiar terrain for themselves. So that was my first sort of um, venture into the uh, cross-cultural collaborative practice. And uh, I didn't want it to remain in silos. So very easily I could have uh, taken um, a Bollywood music troupe that visited from India, commissioned them to come and perform in the park, brought in a lot of Bollywood audiences and uh, called it quits. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to work with a little bit more depth into the whole program. So I wanted the collections in the park in the mix. Uh, and that way, actually, the people who came to watch this show then got to know that this park is a beautiful space where sculptors from different parts of the world exhibited, uh, other artists exhibited. And there was this whole confluence of cultures just through the mingling of the audiences in the park. And um, it was a very successful program, ran for, I mean, that was the first year we were commissioned and then it ran up to 2011. And we did some absolutely wonderful work mm, through the five years and uh, increased the visibility of the park in the local uh, diaspora much, much uh, beyond expectation, so to speak. And once our work was over, uh, we sort of stepped back into doing other things, but we still work with the park on and off as and when required. Um, but it is the, that that was a one-time program that actually um, turned over the audience in the park. So that was my first sort of foray into this cross-cultural collaborative practice. And um, uh, I have done a number of things since, uh, but the earlier days uh, are very strong in my memory because it was about the whole journey of where I wanted to be. I wanted to be a performer. I wanted to compose music. I was immersed in music. And I found that my path into doing that was quite uh, circuitous because, I, and I had to enjoy the journey as much as getting there because uh, I couldn't straight away announce myself as this musician composer. I had to experiment, find out the lay of the land, uh, meet the people that could make this happen. And also, um, you know, the, it, was, it was a case of wandering away from my main objective because as the company, as Manasamitra grew, I got requests to do uh, education-based work. I got requests to do university-based work, community-based work, and as well as performance, one of performances. And uh, that would sort of take me away from that original goal of making new work and music and that kind of thing. But I enjoyed it and it did sort of uh, profile the organization in the, for the, with the local funders and it, it helped set a scene, so to speak, for my work for the future, which I'll talk about shortly. And um, so that was my initial journey. And uh, finally, in 2011, I made this break from uh, thinking about uh, where I was going into actually arriving in the place that I wanted to be. So it took me five years. But then in 2011, I decided that I was going to create new work, find the funding, bring in collaborators, showcase the work, and just do exactly what I had set out to do in the first place. So it took me those five years. Um, and, you know, I, I finally uh, sort of am at that place where 
I'm doing things that I ab absolutely, absolutely enjoy doing. And um, I have I work with collaborators that I enjoy working with as well. So before I go into the whole aspect of the various projects that I've done, at least highlighted projects, and also uh, what kind of funding sources and how what relationships were formed, etc. Uh, if you have any questions at this point, then I'm happy to talk through the first part of my musical career life. Uh, anything really. Welcome to put any questions in the chat if you don't feel like actually speaking out in a Zoom session. I know it's quite daunting. So if you have any questions throughout, you can just pop them in the chat. Um, uh, I guess I have a question for you, Supriya, um, which is um, how do you um, persevere with such um, determination? Because um, I'm quite interested in this concept of, of failure. Um, and you say, you know, you keep persevering and you keep going. But what is your attitude towards failure and success and trial and error? Um, do you have any advice or, um, cause I know you say your, your mantra is, is, um, is to network. Um, was there a, a point in which you, um, you felt like successful and on the right track with your, um, your networking because I, I and, and instead of, you know, kept, keep getting kind of pushed back. Yeah, uh, yes, Jess. I mean, the various aspects of your question, and one of the things I mentioned was about, uh, you know, how do you take a no or a closed door? And I think that's really important, especially in the creative sector, uh, because artists have uh, a vision of their project and, you know, they are passionate about their vision. I am passionate about my vision. And if somebody uh, that you've approached has said no, uh, you're immediately, the immediate feeling is of uh, dejection and you feel uh, thwarted in your attempts to actually bring this absolutely wonderful thing to light. Uh, but the reality is that the no is probably, and I won't say in all cases, but in most of the cases, the no is probably not directed at you or your work, but it's at the place where the person saying the no is at that time. So it could be a case of, they do have funding, but this project is probably not suitable for the funding that they have at that point in time. They love the passion, they love the drive, they love your project, but they do not find a way to actually fund it at that point. So my, uh, my tactic is to always keep in touch with everybody that you've come across and you know keep them posted with the work that you do. And they do come back, for example, uh, South Bank Center, I started talking to South Bank and everybody here knows how big they are and they're the, one of the biggest organizations. So big also means uh, very bureaucratic as well. So um, what happens is that uh, when I approach them, uh, first I approach them in about 2018. And in 2018, uh, we started to talk and there was nothing suitable and, you know, they loved the idea, they loved lullaby. And then they invited me to uh, do something in 2019. I couldn't because the dates weren't available and we kept talking. So a no uh, at that point didn't mean really a no. And it kept talking, people changed. And the other thing that happens in big organizations is people change. And, you know, the people that you meet on your way up, as in, so to speak, uh, are the people that matter really. So, I mean, sometimes the top uh, uh, top boss in an organization moves on and then the people that you have been dealing with then become capable of making those decisions that you will then, uh, they will bring you into the place. So that really did happen with South Bank. So the people that we're talking to move sideways into another team and the ladies who actually really love my work actually took me in and uh, showcased the work in February 2020. And Lullaby was a success. We performed at, in Queen Elizabeth Hall and it was sold out. It was wonderful, but it took a long time. And I could have at any point given up. I could have said, well, they didn't want my work. So I might as well not bother calling them again or writing to them again. But 
it never happens uh, you know if so in a way i i do keep my sort of goal in in front of me all the time so is this where i want to go so it doesn't matter if somebody has said no i would probably find another route in or i would keep going back uh, for when it's going i always one of the things i always do is thank the people who have said no so if somebody has told me no thank you but we're not happy with not not happy but i know we don't want your work right now i always say thank you very much i'm really glad to know that uh, you you've still seen the work and i'm hoping that at a future date we can so i keep that dialogue alive i don't close it there because it's important that they understand that it's not personal it's just it's just not convenient for them at that time so that is actually um one of the techniques that i use in my in my working practice <laughs> anything else anybody wants to ask sorry we have a question here uh, how ooh, how do you keep your research up to date um thank you leila um how do i keep my research up to date um i always for that i'll give you an example of uh, sound of tea which is my latest piece of work so for sound of tea i have partners who are university partners so uh, i have i have a professor from the university college of arts london who has um, made tea tables for me uh, i have a tea expert beverly Wainwright, who is based in Scotland, and I have various artists who are musicians. I have a, a tea ceremony expert, a performer, and and various other partners. But the way I keep the research fresh is um, every time we perform or um, you know uh, do the next stage of the show, I talk to uh, Beverly, for example, about the tea practices. and we talk about everything from what kind of tea is grown to what the difficulties are in the tea plantations because beverly for example travels to uh, myanmar and um, uh, she travels to sri lanka a lot so we not only talk about the tea but we also talk about what is happening in the world of tea so it is it is the difficulties the tea workers are facing uh, and even with relation to covid and things like that so i talk to people you know all the time so when i'm in the throes of making a project happen for at least 24 months i'm talking to everybody involved in the process so i could be talking to the musicians to see what they feel about certain pieces and the musicians range from people in india to some poets that i'm working with in canada to a lyricist who's who's based in india again and musicians based here who are the actually uh, actual point of delivery so you know i'm working with uh, different kinds of musicians in this country my tea performer comes from china and she brings with her the knowledge of what is happening in that world and so that's how i keep my research live because it has to be relevant when a, when when an audience actually come into a performance the whole performance has to be relevant to what's happening in the world outside so my tea poems for example are refreshed uh because the poet that i liaise with in canada uh there are two poets i liaise with in canada and both of them are actually doing their phd on tea so they are constantly refreshing their own practice and it so it helps me to keep on top of things as well so uh that's how i actually keep my research up to date um so i'll i'll just um sort of go over and give you some examples of um projects that i've done in the last maybe 6 or 7 years uh, relevant projects and also a little bit about where i went for funding how i actually work with funding and um i will talk about um, what is in the present as well so various things that i'm doing at the minute so the, the i think the one of the main things that uh, happened in 2015 was a partnership with york minster now york minster as everybody knows is a very uh, again a very bureaucratic organization in that sense because they have a lot of uh, you know different levels of uh, leadership within the, within the group and at some point there was an idea that i would compose an even song for them and uh, that was a fantastic 
uh, absolutely uh, wonderful opportunity for somebody like me because I am a practicing Hindu. So for me to, for a South Asian woman who's a practicing Hindu to actually compose an even song, it seemed like a perfect sort of interfaith uh, opportunity. And I really jumped at the chance. And I had a fantastic collaborator in one of the canons in the Minster um, who I knew from a long time ago. Again, one of those relationships you keep and build and uh, just retain and in the back burner. And it, it actually happened that he was the one who was sort of uh, fronting the project. And um, so between the two of us, we worked together for a year behind the scenes before the text or the anthem was approved um, for me to actually go ahead and compose music for the even song choir. And uh, I think the one of the best moments in, in that year was when the choir actually performed it in the in the in the Minster. And it was it was a blend of uh, South Indian Karnatic ragas set to the anthem in English and accompanied by the organ. So it was it was like a confluence of various things and effortlessly done because the choir is of course composed of fantastic singers. So it was it was a doddle for them. I mean they, they didn't they didn't have a problem singing it at all. And uh, but for me it was it was another of those real milestones in my journey because to grow up in Bombay and then come into the UK leave banking, uh, do music, and then to receive a commission to perform, uh, to compose for uh, York Minster was like, yes, that, that, that is sort of where I want to be. That is the zone I want to be. That is the space that I want to occupy. And that, that was uh, very inspirational. And it sort of inspired me to do other things. And then the next thing that happened was the, the most brilliant um, inspiration was um, the Lullaby Project. Now, the lullaby, just by nature of the name, when you know, when I said I was doing a project on lullabies, almost invariably it brought a smile to people's faces. Everybody was like, "Oh, that sounds lovely," and you know, immediately it, it was heartwarming. And um, I wanted to explore. The idea was, um, I, I actually had this idea when I was visiting my uh, village temple uh, in Tamil Nadu in India. And I was, uh, I was fascinated by the idea that mothers working in fields could keep their children who were at a distance uh, peaceful and quiet, not necessarily sleeping, but peaceful and quiet. They, and that really fascinated me that they could do that with their voices. So that sort of set off the chain of what is a lullaby and why is it um, so peaceful and restful? Is it because it's very... Um, very simple in its musical construct? Or is it because uh, of the familiarity of the mother's voice uh, or the parent's voice? Because in Norway, I found that a lot of fathers sing their children to sleep. It's not just the mothers. Um, and that was, uh, that was another interesting revelation for me. So that was, that was the basis of the Lullaby Project. And it was, it has been, it, it is still continues to be one of the most uh, participative, engaging, and very personal projects that I'm, I'm currently even doing. Because the projects travel to a number of countries in the world, still traveling, and everywhere we go, that project and that performance is very, very bespoke to the place that it is in. So for me, that is sort of the best example of collaborative practice uh, in, in many senses, because uh, for example, we were invited to uh, take the project to Parramatta and Sydney, and uh, we went there. Uh, we were supposed to go this year. Unfortunately, we, we can't. We went last year. And uh, what we did when we went there, Parramatta uh, is a very multicultural community, um, and we, we have a number of, uh, you know, it's, it's a almost a newly improved suburb, uh, desired suburb in Sydney with, uh, with a lot of uh, communities settling there from different parts of the world. And Riverside Theatre in Parramatta is a very important space, both for performance and for the community. So we were part of their Spot On Festival. And um, when we went there well, uh, well in advance, 
and we encouraged uh, they had a week uh, the festival was running over a week and we were scheduled to perform on the last couple of days so for the week we spend um, collecting lullabies from little children parents and then we walked around the entire uh, area um, and actually went on the boat to sydney to collect sounds um, and so the performance that the soundscape that duncan chapman who works with me created was composed of uh, the sounds of paramatta the voices of paramatta uh, with indian lullabies that i was singing and also lullabies that were sung by mothers from within the community so when the community actually came in to listen to the performance uh, the entire setting of the performance is also one of those really inviting ones where uh, people are invited to come and just uh, lie down on cushions um, there is a specific uh, piece of uh, uh, light work that's been created a program that's been created by professor mick grierson uh, again same gentleman that i worked with for sound of tea he created a program called lumisonic which was about inviting deaf children to listen to music so i wanted diversity and collaboration with different kinds of audiences so this was one other uh, example of how we could collaborate with some uh, children who couldn't listen to music so the lumisonic actually uh, translates the music into a visual concentric circles so audiences come into the space they sit in these concentric because the circles are projected right down on the audiences they sit in the circles uh, they relax and lie down on cushions and they are listening to the soundscape with familiar sounds because they can identify sounds from paramatta and and also voices and they feel belong to the show so the show is not about showcasing the uh, talent of the artist alone and the artist in this case that i worked with was a saxophone player called rafael from sydney and i uh, that is the way the lullaby show works everywhere we go to the show has a, a local artist working with us because it's improvised uh, the artist finds it easy to blend in and uh, somehow i don't know it's a combination of luck and uh, knowing the right people i've always found collaborators who are happy to join and improvise and um, you know uh, have that uh, experience of working with us we enjoy it and uh, they enjoy it as well and in many cases we have worked again with them so we have this now we have the small collection of artists from different parts of the world that i actually approached during lockdown and we've been doing some lockdown live sessions with all these people so it's been a continued association and that is in a way a true collaborative practice where you keep the relationships as well going forward and um, i i did say i was going to talk about what a collaborative practice meant to me and i made some notes i think a, a collaborative practice for me first of all is based on trust trust is the biggest thing between whoever i'm collaborating with whether it is beverly who's the tea expert or whether it's one of the musicians who works with me or it is um the lyric writer who works with me anybody who so there has to be trust between us that we will and a bit of flexibility so i'm i'm definitely very democratic in my approach to collaboration i have i don't have parameters that i will not flex so i i know broadly what i where i want to get but because i i can be democratic in my head i find it easier to accept uh opinions and views that will shape the project better and i'll always recognize talent and ideas from my collaborators and incorporate that i don't have a problem um you know um with structures i don't have this thing that it's my idea so i have to keep it very strictly in those parameters the way exactly as i visioned it so actually the end results i find are much more uh, much richer and much more mixed and sometimes it's unexpected results even for me i'm delighted with what comes uh, out in the end so that that is one of the things trust and then um i think the other main purpose of collaboration for me is to reach the work to a wider sector uh, i 
I studied classical South Indian music. So if I stuck in that box and I did only that in the traditional way, then I would only have the same audiences every time. And I might have a niche following, but uh, that would not actually uh, satisfy my artistic soul. I want my work to be able to uh, sit comfortably anywhere. So my collaboration, my collaborative practice has that idea at the core that I have made my home here in Britain. So I want to be able to reach my music to everybody who wants to hear and enjoy. I don't know that, um, you know, uh, how, I don't know how my music is going to be received, say in Finland or in uh, Britain or in Australia or Portugal, anywhere. So I want them to be able to come in, sit down and listen to Lullaby without any barriers. I don't want, I don't want that music to be defined and placed in a box. And so that's been sort of the driver behind my collaborations. And I've worked with different musicians from different genres. Um, I've worked with dance artists. I've worked with um, VR artists. I've worked with I'm, I'm in the process of working with uh, people who are making a uh, podcast and an app happen, uh, VR app happen where you can actually virtually come in and sit in a concert and listen to it. And I'm sort of working with them on uh, something anywhere where, you know, you're comfortable with people. But that's also been my other, other sort of uh, driving force. I like people. I like working with people. I, I I think everybody comes to the table with ideas. I think no idea is uh, no idea is bad. All ideas are good. I like to I like that whole blending of ideas. But but I also find that uh, your energy attracts similar energy in. So in a way, I know this is very uh, philosophical, but. I find that um, you you throw out a positive energy out there and you you bring back positivity from people. And I think that has held me in good stead over these years. I mean, for the last 15 years, I've sort of followed that practice of throwing out the good energy and actually consciously stepping back from something that I feel does not actually transmit that good energy, recognizing that you cannot collaborate with everybody. That's also been a very important lesson. There are people that like to work in a certain way. If, if that doesn't match with, you know, and doesn't bring teamwork in, then gracefully step back from that. And, you know, it's a learning. And then next time you know that uh, that's not something you want to do again. So I've, I've had good and bad experiences, mostly good though. Um, and it's, it's, been, it's been a good journey so far. And I'll stop there again at that point to find out if anybody wants to ask anything. Jennifer? Um, yeah, thank you. I'm really enjoying it. It's really, uh, really interesting um, talk. I just was interested in what you were talking about building trust and, um, you know, collaborating with different people and how that trust is really important. And I wondered, like, you know, if you were in a situation where you had of quite a modest budget um, to collaborate with other artists, but you didn't know who they were necessarily gonna be, like how you might like build that relationship in a very short time. So it was only for like, say one day's work or whatever, like, you know, how, how you might go about that. I think budgets usually are always, in my experience, short because you never have the right amount of money to give an artist you think who deserves it but uh, the key is uh, getting to uh, you know if say I'm just going to take an example of perhaps you have 500 pounds and you want to do a day's work uh, or a day in the studio whatever it is you want to do and you're looking for a certain vibe so you have say you're looking for a drum player a drum kit player and, and I'm just quoting this as an example and you, you need it. I would, uh, if that is the case, then I would go to the people that I trust already and ask them if they knew somebody. That would be my first port of call. And if they knew nobody in their circles who could do, give me that kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, experience, then I would go out into 
little further asking organizations that I work with or worked with in the past, asking them if they have anybody in mind. More, more likely than not, between these two options, there would be uh, a host of recommendations. And if uh, you say you got four recommendations, I would then pick up the phone and speak to each of these people and get a vibe for where they are at. It's possible that they are busy on that day. It's possible that they love the idea of the project. Uh, it's possible. And also have a brief overview of the kind of work they have done in the past. Are they adventurous? Would they be up for something like this? Uh, or um, are they in, you know, uh, and when you talk to people, you sort of are able to get them. Uh, you know, some people are very used to being in a certain world and don't like to leave that world. And some people are like, yes, let's go for it. Let's see where it's leading you to. And then, you know, in a worst case scenario, if the budget is really, really small, then uh, I would even say this is towards, if it is towards a larger project, I would say, look, this is towards a larger project. Would you give me an hour of your time so that we can jam and see what happens? And then um, I have that same work with, uh, I'm going to do the same with one other person and I'm going to make a decision based on that. But I'll pay you, I don't know, I'll pay you 50 pounds just, just for a feel of how you feel towards the music and I feel and work on it that way. Now, more often than not, I found that I will find that one person that works well for the project, for, for me and for future collaboration. And I never have seen a collaboration as being a one-time thing. It's always been a long-term thing. So if I'm, because I'm constantly in this uh, zone of uh, actually touring a piece of work and at the same time, completing the research on the second project or second piece of work, and then having an idea on the boil where I go out looking for funding. So there's always three things happening in the life of the company and me at any time. So there is always future potential for this person to work on the next project. So it's always going to be a long-term collaboration rather than a very short-term one. And in, in case, uh, you know, future doesn't work, it doesn't work, but if it suits that one, it suits that one. I have a question for you um, about uh, working with Art, you work with an art, uh, lots of different artists across all the art forms. Um, how do you deal with um, conflicting ideas and um, a multitude of different visions um, and make sure that everyone's voices are heard? Um, how do you kind of manage that whilst also trying to steer in a bit of your own vision? I think I think it is it is a it is a combination of democracy and leadership. Uh, so if I have initiated, conceptualized, and I am directing a project, then unconsciously, I am the leader of the project in a, in, in, in a, in, in a way. And what then happens is we have a team of artists who are working with me, and we are working together, we are brainstorming ideas. And, you know, uh, I'll, the nearest example I'll give you of uh, is making Sound of Tea and all of us sitting together and discussing what an oolong so, uh, could sh sound like. So different people have different ideas of what a oolong is. When is it drunk? Is it drunk on a um, uh, sunny evening on the slopes of the tea plantation in China? Or is it drunk um, in the back garden in Surrey? Or where is it drunk? So everybody, when you say the word oolong, many people have different visions. So what we then decided was rather than just pursue with the visions, because we realized immediately that everybody has a different picture of Oolong. Maybe it's a happy memory. Maybe it's a, you know, whatever, how they feel about the drink. Maybe some people haven't tasted Oolong, so they don't know what a Oolong looks like, sounds like uh, or tastes like. So what we did was we actually went out and bought some really good Oolong tea and we all sat down and we drank the tea. We, we waited and physically drank the tea and waited for the ideas to flow. And then uh, we went out there and um, we sort of started to formulate tunes on how, how we think a oolong sounds, what kind of melody, what kind of raga will a oolong sound like? And it, it you know, suggestions flowed. 
and I think uh, it was actually a suggestion from one of my colleagues uh, who was at the time, uh, uh, who I think it was a suggestion from Karen who plays the flute. And she said, well, you know, this actually the oolong has these notes and, you know, it, it's this is how it is made. So maybe we should think of this. And we all said yes. So, I mean, in a way, I am sort of the initiator leader of the project. But if the idea is good, then I would feel very comfortable in putting all the other ideas. To, and, you know, I also find that working in that way means that if people know voices are heard and everything, it's not it's not a complete, um, you know, structured program, then ideas flow. And I think, the, again, it comes back to the trust between collaborators. Collaborators are happy to trust everybody in a way that they are happy to let go of their ideas. So it's very important to let go of your idea if something else is better and recognizing that through the trust that is formed between relationships. So, yeah, that's an example of what we did with Oolong as uh, as to how we work with collaborators and conflicting ideas. I don't think I've ever encountered a situation in all this time, and many times in the bank, of course, but never in the creative sector where uh, we've had uh, fights actually about ideas. It's like, my idea is better. No, you're my idea. I don't think I've had that, but I've had that in the bank where you know we've fought for, th not me personally, but people have fought for things. So <laughs> I'm definitely in a better world. Abby? Hi, Sophia. Um, my question is, um, I wonder what this year's looked like for you in terms of keeping collaborations going with all the restrictions and not being able to meet up and travel, and also what, what you've learned and what advice you might give to people to help them keep collaborations going if you can only do them remotely. Um, I must say I've had an extremely successful 2020, unexpectedly. So when the, when the <laughs> yeah, yes, of course. When, when the whole uh, epidemic of pandemic hit, um, I, I, I traveled uh, extensively in January. I visited three countries in January, which was, which was a lot. And I was scheduled to visit four other countries this year. Uh, we had this uh, thing in Australia, we had, uh, festival in Greece, Portugal, and uh, one booked in Sweden, which we all had to cancel. But um, and so, of, of course, come March, I was completely uh, down because I was like, oh my God, I'm going to do now. These are all, remember, these are all commissioned things. So funding is one aspect of our work, but then commissioned work, to lose so much for commissioned work, it was, um, it was very difficult at that point. And we were uh, sort of upset. I mean, I was definitely upset. When I say, when I keep saying we, Manasa Mitra is myself and Jacqueline Greaves, who's uh, the general manager. And um, I'll come back to Abby's question, but the reason uh, we are, we are a tiny organization. Uh, and the reason for keeping it tiny is to keep the core costs really low. But for me to be able to do what I want to do without doing the things that I don't want to do, which is what Jacqueline does. Jacqueline likes doing those things. She doesn't do like doing what I do. So we make a great team because she likes doing what she does. I like doing what I do and we don't like doing each other's jobs. Um, and we are a really tiny organization with Jacqueline working two days and me working 24 seven. Uh, but I enjoy it. So that it's not a job for me. Uh, uh, so coming back to um, Abby's question about 2020. So at that point we were uh, a bit panic stricken on what, what we were going to do for the rest of the year. And uh, luckily we did apply for Arts Council emergency funding and we got it. So we could, we knew that we were going to survive uh, the next six months, but nothing beyond that. But then what happened was I had to uh, continue to keep my musical language live. So I then approached all the artists that I've worked with over the last five years, all the collaborators from different parts of the world and I said, look, all of us, uh, we need to actually work with you. Would you be able to just send me a half an hour improvised um, score? I mean, improvised uh, piece of music based on this raga. So what I did was for each of the improvisations, I gave them a visual. So for the first visual, I said, it is a spring afternoon. The birds are singing in the trees. Uh, the uh, cherry blossom is out and you're sitting in the garden and playing the harp. So can you actually play the harp for me, Lucy, for half an hour? 
And this is the scale I might want you to think of. So I gave them a scale. I gave Lucy a scale and Lucy uh, was one of the first collaborators to do that with me. So she said, oh, that sounds really exciting. I want to do something considering we are all doing nothing at the minute. Everybody was uh, in a state of shock at the minute when the pandemic hit. So she sent me the first piece of music and Duncan Chapman, who I work with, is a sound artist uh, that I collaborate on many of my projects. Uh, he said, right, I'm going to learn broadcasting. So he learned broadcasting. She sent an improvised piece. And I responded to that live on Facebook. And that was one of the biggest successes of our 2020 um, sort of, uh, you know, the whole last six months, because uh, we've done 16 of those programs now with different artists from across the world. Um, and uh, from we've had viewership from ranging from 70 people to 150,000 people. And that has been a shock for the system because when we touched 150,000 people, it, we, we genuinely couldn't understand where this viewership is coming from. And since we have had about one, one and a half thousand, that kind of thing, it has not always been 150,000, but something about that one show really attracted a certain group of people and we have yet to get to the bottom of that. But as a result, I also then started um, receiving a lot of commissions uh, to do Lullaby as a paid digital program for a number of uh, organizations, including Naimas in North Yorkshire. Um, uh, we did some for South Bank. We did, we did uh, you know, and I work uh, with Sound and Music quite a bit. It's a national organization. For those of you who don't know Sound and Music, fantastic national organization who promote all kinds of composers and have a number of schemes going. And I've been uh, fortunate to be on not only their schemes, but also on a number of their advisory panels and all sorts of things. So I work with them and um, I've done a lot of podcasts and I uh, am currently working on a couple of scores for two dance productions funded by Arts Council. So to answer your question, Abhi, surprisingly, unexpectedly, I have been uh, frantically busy this year and uh, looking really busy up to April next year and then wondering what to do after that. So, <laughs> and uh, we, uh, we, are all, we also filmed Sound of Tea because, and we're going to release it as a video album because uh, live shows are not uh, permissible till, we are hoping it'll happen in June. So we have one live program scheduled in June in, uh, in National Center for Early Music York. So if any of you are interested in tea, drinking tea, or anything to do with tea, come along for the show in June, which will be announced shortly. But um, uh, apart from that, uh, we've uh, we have also released, uh, I've also released my first uh, audio album, Dust Notes, which was another major exercise because uh, I thought uh, I liked only live performances. I wasn't into releasing albums, but somehow Dusk, Dusk Notes happened uh, because of a chance meeting with uh, Jarvis Cocker and Jeremy Deller and them encouraging me to release this album, which I didn't think I would have otherwise, but thanks to them. And uh, Dusk Notes is re uh, was released in November. So yes, I've been busy. <laughs> um, oh, Heidi's got a question. Heidi. I, I was just wondering, uh, apart from this year, you know, sort of since you established uh, Manasamitra, what are the sort of broader changes that you've seen in that you've observed in the cultural sector? I'm particularly interested in sort of um, how how you get work might have changed. I'm, I'm interested in, you know, is it is it is it are you more likely to just get a straight commission for an existing project or is it more satisfying to you to work with an organisation at an early stage to develop a project and apply for, for funding together? Ha, has that changed in any way over the past 15 years? I think um, there's two, there are two elements of this. One is how the sector itself has changed and morphed over these last 15 years. Uh, funding, I think, has definitely uh, shrunk in the last 15 years. Uh, you know, where there was uh, money uh, to develop and uh, do projects in a more extended manner, I think funding has shrunk to a point where uh, you have to know precisely what project you want to do and who you do want to do it with. Uh, preferably have 
support from organizations and other uh, bodies around you to be able to deliver the project. So the aspect of funding has changed. And that has, I think, uh, to a large degree, uh, increased the voluntary community aspect of artists uh, in the community, but decreased the uh, income for the professional musicians, uh, professional artists in the community. And by that, I mean that um, there has been a mushrooming of voluntary organizations that want to work in the community, support artists, and uh, you know, do interesting um, pieces of work, but uh, uh, you know, where professional artists want to have to be paid uh, day rates, and uh, that has that has slightly actually decreased from from two thousand and six to two thousand and twenty, even more so maybe in the last three four years. With funding, the I would say that um, just to give an example of how I would approach, uh, you know. Uh, the aspect of funding having an idea is all very good but i think it's really 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 important to find uh, festivals venues uh, partners it could be universities it could be schools if you're reaching out to do some um, you know partnership working with schools it could be anybody but you need to have proper um, monetary support from any of these partners. It is not anymore enough to have uh, in-kind support. It is good to have in-kind support, but unless and until you have uh, proper cash support, no funder is 100% willing to risk it anymore. So it's kind of, why would we be investing 100% on your work if nobody else is willing to give you any bit of that support so it's a bit of a conundrum i think i think to answer you heidi um it has become more difficult for new entrants to the sector to find their feet it might take them longer it's not impossible you if you still have the right contacts make the right contacts network persist and you know you you continue to do those things you will but it has become slightly a bit more difficult than when uh, I entered the sector even 15 years ago. And um, it is also about having relationships and establishing them and it takes time. So relationship with Arts Council, relationship with PRS for music. I mean, the, I approach funding from the point of view of who would fund music. And so I have established relationship with long-term music funding organizations. But at the same time, the other artists could find funds elsewhere. Um, looking for commissions that fit your work in entirety. The one key thing that has changed in the last maybe even three years is that if you're applying for any monies or commission or a job or anything that anybody has to offer, the minute you try to shoehorn your work into that, you are mostly bound to be unsuccessful. If that work is made for you, if you read a brief and you think this is exactly what I'm doing and this is exactly where my project is, then you should apply. Because we all make, I make the same mistake and I have had a number of rejections as well where you, know, you sort of are tempted to apply because it's a big uh, commission and it's a great organization and it's, it is similar to your idea, but it's not exactly what you're thinking. And that can be clearly seen. So when, you, when I'm sitting on the other side of the fence and I'm reading applications, immediately it's visible that this person's tried to fit their project into this grant guidelines. And that increasingly is becoming really difficult in the last three years, because I know that uh, each, uh, each fund or each commission or each each thing is oversubscribed many, many times over. So um, I would say, uh, you know, when you're applying for funding, just make sure that it is the right fund for you. And uh, in, all, in all possibility, I think Arts Council has got the broadest uh, brush of them all. They are the people who fund uh, a broad range of projects. So uh, they are the go-to actually, uh, if you're not sure that there is a fund out there. That has changed. Entry level difficulty has marginally increased. But I think if you're persistent and you know exactly where your 
you know where you're going you know the uh, final goal post then your journey may be a little bit more circuitous and little you may meander a little bit more but you will get there because um, that persistence does pay is what i would say have i answered your question heidi was that <laughs> That was really, really interesting, actually, Supriya, saying about the, the different fundings. Um, yeah, super interesting. Um, I have just have a quick question for you. Um, uh, when we spoke earlier, you mentioned that you're, you're really interested in this mentoring scheme um, and kind of helping people at the very start of their journey, um, giving advice and um, generally just being there. So I wonder if you could just speak a little bit about that. Yeah. Um... So in 2018, um, I got this commission with HCMF to make a 20 minute piece. For me, that again was a milestone in my career because I am a local musician, but to actually have a commission from such a prestigious festival, that was, that was for me a fantastic achievement. And so, but when I started working on that again, collaboratively, I had uh, five singers and five musicians from different drawn from different bits and working together on this piece that was uh, that was about Zen and peace and you know the, what we needed the what the world needed at the time and um, there is a project that is brewing and I'm still working on it called Dark Skies which is about light pollution and this was sort of the first foray into it so I made a piece called Pleiades which was about the constellation Pleiades. And it had a resonance with my Indian roots because Pleiades was about uh, the Indian god uh, with uh, Kritika, with seven stars and et cetera, et cetera. So there was a connection there. And when I uh, made that piece, I looked around and realized that I didn't have anybody that I could speak to who looked like me and made music like me. And, you know, so we had... I mean, there, there are plenty of uh, South Asian artists who perform. There's no dearth. But when we look at South Asian artists who compose and who are women, I found that there were practically none. And that for me was uh, uh, quite a revelation, con you know, considering we are in 2019 uh, Britain. And I was like, where are all these women who sing beautifully and can compose? But, you know, uh, where are these women? So that then led me to think that uh, potentially South Asian women do not consider composing as a career. And actually it can be a very effective career because they, have, they bring to the table something that is quite unique. And um, so when I asked around, did some research, the only two people that uh, people, anybody could identify within the South Asian composing uh, sort of world was uh, Nitin Soni and Talvin Singh. They were, they, they were the names that came up. That was it. And a few people mentioned Ravi Shankar, who is now uh, unfortunately passed away, but he's a sitar player, not a composer. He did compose, but he's... So, I mean, this whole uh, visual of the South Asian music and women was like very, very poor in my... Uh, and uh, so, so one of the things I wanted to do was to change that. And so I went up to PRSF and I said, look, this is what I've encountered. I think there is something there that we need to uh, be able to change. And they were very much up for that idea. So I applied and uh, I've started a mentoring scheme. Uh, and the mentoring scheme is to give um, South, and I found that it's, it's slightly wider. So I've extended the scheme to uh, women, um, uh, from color creatives from different, uh, different uh, parts of the world. And so I have uh, five wonderful mentees, one of whom is here today with us, Satnam. Um, and um, uh, I'm hoping that they don't have to reinvent the wheel like I had to do. So my whole purpose for this is to make sure that I'm able to clarify things. Practical help, which sometimes, you know, you don't have people to ask these questions of. And I want to extend the scheme beyond this pilot, uh, uh, pilot uh, project as well. I want to be able to make this a much more, uh, in, you know, uh, open scheme that will in include many more composers, not maybe even necessarily from, uh, uh, you know, a different background, diverse background, but maybe even composers who are just starting off as well. So that's the vision for the scheme. Sounds great. Um, 
Does anyone have any uh, final uh, final questions for Supriya? Um, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. I like your entrepreneurial spirit, positive vibes, and uh, nice to see us another Indian woman full of uh, hopes, dreams, ideas. And I'm, I think you made the Thursday afternoon very, very lively and dynamic for me. And thank you. Um, thank you. And by the way, I've, um, um, my, my name is Shanta and I, I also run a very small microscopic organization <laughs> uh, called Annapurna Indian Dance. And I've invited uh, uh, Supriya to take over our Facebook for three days. Uh, three wise men for 12 days of Christmas. <laughs> three, three wise musicians and um, something like that. So she's always open-minded. And I asked, when I asked her, she immediately said, yes, I will do this, this, and this. Um, so I look forward to that. And uh, thank you for showing uh, friendship and camaraderie in that. <laughs> thank uh, you, Shanta. That's all. I don't think I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck to all the things you do. It's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. So I just wanted to, I mean, if nobody has any questions, I can always tell you what's brewing. Uh, well, literally sound of tea, of course, uh, because the video album is coming out. Uh, but also, um, I, I've uh, the things that I have planned for 2021 immediately are... Um, I was looking at uh, my own identity as a Tamil uh, singer, Tam a person of Tamil descent uh, living in the UK. And, um, and uh, so what I have done is um, proposed an R&D with a poet, um, one based in Canada and one based here, to explore uh, Tamil metered poetry from uh, 6th century BC. So I'm hoping that project's just been, uh, funding's just been agreed. I'm, I'm not yet able to uh, sort of announce it because the organization in question has not yet announced it themselves. So I'll announce it shortly, but uh, funding's been agreed and hopefully uh, it's, it's a very exciting project. I'm really looking forward because one of the collaborators on that one will be a Japanese drummer. So we are gonna have Tamil poetry explored through a Japanese drum with a poet from Canada and a poet from here. So that's the kind of vibe that that project will have. Uh, I'm also starting a podcast series about, uh, um, you know, music from different parts of the world and how Indian musicians can engage with it. So that's something that I'm working on at the minute for 2021. Um, and um, I made a quick note, couple of, uh, um, a couple of CDs that are coming out, albums that are coming out, which, which I've been able to do because it's locked down. One is about um, a pose of fireflies, which is relating to my experience of fireflies. And I was, like I mentioned, dark skies. Uh, it's a thing that I'm working on. And that is through a PRSF Jerwood Composer Fund. And also um, I'm, I'm doing some work with... Um, I'm releasing an album with, if, for those of you who know Ben Castle, a uh, saxophonist, a jazz uh, saxophonist. Uh, his father, Roy Castle, was very, very famous uh, on TV. Um, and Ben and me, uh, we are working with Sri Sriram, who's also a very famous uh, part of the duo, Badmarsh and Sri. And the three of us are releasing an album in um, March. So, two albums in the making and two projects all before June, 2021. So just keeping me slightly busy. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that all sounds super exciting. Um, just before we finish, Christine had a question, yes. um, which is, it would be good to know what apps, programs, tools are good for virtual collaborations? Um, Yes, Zoom is pretty difficult for, for collaboration and, and live playing. Does, does anyone or Supriya, do you have any you can recommend? Um, to answer your question, Christine, the way we work at the minute for the virtual live sessions and you know live uh, broadcast, um, I Skype in and Duncan uses OBS. He also uses an app called Sonobus. To be honest, I'm not the expert on that element of it. He is. 
So if you are, if you can email me, I'm very happy to connect you to Duncan and he'll be able to take you through the whole, uh, what he does kind of what, because he's experimented and found something that works for us at the minute. So he'll be happy, more than happy to share that with you. So email me and I'll be able to put you in touch. Thank you. I will. And I also wanted to ask if women know about Music Port Festival. Yes. Um, so it's a great, you know, it's, I love it. It's a world music festival. Um, and I feel like it's very much in the spirit of what we're talking about. Totally. I know Jim and Sue very well. Ah, um, we cool. brought Bollywood Jazz there two years ago. And I came, I don't know if you come every year, but uh, there was this, if you remember this strange lady cooking and singing, that was me. There are so many wonderful <laughs> okay. women cooking and singing. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I've done a couple of uh, uh, editions for uh, Music Port. And I think Shanta has done a little bit of work for them and Satnam is doing some work for them next year. Mm. So they're very much in our sort of radar. And uh, if the work is right, then I'm sure Jimensu will uh, take the work uh, yeah. anytime. Cool. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, great. Well, um, just like to say a massive, massive thank you to Supriya. I mean, like your experience and, um, all of your performances and everything you've been doing is just super inspirational. Um, and I, I think we can really, even over Zoom, get a, your personality shines through. Um, yeah. So it's really, really been lovely to hear you speak. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see what else you get up to and, and hopefully get to come to one of your actual performances uh, in 2021. Um, and yeah, just um, to remind everyone that this is a, a monthly seminar so um keep an eye out in your emails for um what's going to be happening in january um uh, and and also for some kind of feedback um i think we'll be sending something out um and yeah i don't know thanks to thanks to abby and, and heidi as well if there's anything else that you you want to add um awesome oh getting the the silent thumbs up there um <laughs> brilliant yeah so Thanks again to Supriya. Reach out to her for any other burning questions uh, and anything else, um, any feedback, you can always reach out to the Yorkshire Sound Women Network team and hopefully uh, see everyone in January uh, for the next uh, series. I'm getting a bit of sunlight in my eye here. There we go. Wow. Um, yeah, for the, next, um, for the next one in January. So I hope everyone has a great um, holiday, Christmas, um, relaxation period. Um, I'm feeling really inspired. So I'm going to go and write down some ideas now. Um, um, brilliant. I think we'll we'll end there. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much. Unless anyone else has any other. Thank, Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.